Hello again everybody, welcome back to Test Flight in the Mirage 2000. So let's go ahead and take the aircraft up and have a look at the radar system. But first, let me go to the mission editor real quick to fulfill a request from some folks to see the various skins that are available initially. Now, I've been flying with the Chasse 2 slash 5 skin. We also have two different Tiger Meat types of skins, Brazilian Air Force, Greek Air Force, UAE. I'll switch it up if I can remember to do it as I go to use the different skins with UAE on this mission. So let me see what else here. I've got a fuel tank on the center line. I've got a Super 530 missile on Station 2, I've got a missile on Station 1, and we'll, once we get into weapons employment, start to employ the rest of the stuff and explore the rest of the loadout options, but for now, this is what I'm going to go up with. And the mission itself is based off of the 476th Nevada template, I've just added a flight for myself with the Mirage 2000 and the AI flight of Suku 27s that are going to be holding in an orbit at 16,000 feet. It's as simple as that, but let me go ahead and kick it off and get into the air. I'll be right back. And we'll pick things up in the air over Nevada. I've got myself and my wingman and the four Suco 27s out here holding over Dogbone Lake. And what I'm going to do is take my aircraft over to the left, down south towards Creature Force Base, and then set up and try to run an intercept on these guys using the radar. Now, I do have the kneeboard available now. Laskin Grizzly came through for us and provided a file replacement that is going to get us kneeboard functionality in the Mirage. Hopefully, this is something that will be integrated and included in the next update, so we won't have to jump through hoops to get this. But, okay, since I am going to fly out here and hold as I look at the radar system, I'm going to go through the autopilot, and I have read through the manual a couple of times at this point so it should be just a matter now of just sort of putting theory into practice now the autopilot I have two modes I have a basic and an advanced mode and what I wanted to do is just take me out there straight ahead now with the fly-by-wire system I really don't have to do that much you know I usually engage the autopilot when I'm heads down looking around or especially when I'm like holding in a bank just sort of uh, just in like a circular holding pattern in that case I will need to use the autopilot but it won't be as much as I would normally since I can just put the nose there and it's going to hold me more or less straight ahead on the same heading but I will go through this now the basic mode is an attitude hold mode and I have controls for the autopilot down here on the left side underneath the glare shield it's a little dark up there hopefully that you can see it I'll try to make this work now Okay, we have a test button. That's a lights test button, so you can see all four of them with the lights on. Now, to engage the autopilot in basic mode, I had to press the left-hand button once to arm it, twice to engage it. So now, it is actually in the autopilot holding me on this heading. If I had been banked more than 10 degrees, and let me disengage the autopilot. And in fact, I have a button mapped on my stick that is an autopilot disengage button. I've already got that mapped, so I had to press the button and it's disengaged. Now, let me try this. Okay, I'll put it into a bank, and I'm also going to put it into a climb, arm it, engage it, and now it's going to hold me at this climb angle and in this bank. So this is more or less, for now, what, what I do want. Now, I do have advanced modes here, in addition to this basic attitude hold, where I can have it hold me at the current altitude or at a selected altitude that I select using these dials right here so let me try the first mode first it's okay basic current altitude hold mode so second button to press it once to arm it and again to engage it and there we go it holds me in the same bank but now it's going to take me down to the altitude that I was at when I engaged the altitude hold mode okay so yeah that's yeah, this settling in there and that's going to bring the velocity vector back up once it settles back in on that altitude. Okay, so that's fine. Now, selected altitude hold. Now, I'm going to set the dial. This is in hundreds, so just say 18,000 feet. Let me see, what am I at now? Well, I'm at 18.5 right now. Let's say take us up to 19,000 feet and what I would do then is to press the middle button once to arm it, again to engage it. And now it's going to drive me up to the selected altitude. Okay, that's that's cool. Now, I've read that 
as of right now in the first release that we have yeah, it's, see, it's driving me past 19,000. I think what's happening there is it is, from what I understand, it's adding one to each of these numbers. So the behavior right now isn't exactly as intended. So I'm just going to take it back to the basic altitude hold mode and have it settle me in there. But yeah, that seems to be seems to be working just fine. Now we also have a, an approach mode that is going to eventually be able to fly the first part of an ILS approach for us and in the manual it's saying that it's not available in the beta version so eventually we'll be able to get to that and I would imagine that would be just a matter of setting the ILS frequency down here on the panel and then it would just key in on the ILS glide slope and apply that for us but yeah we'll, we'll explore that later for now I'm more or less where I want to be if there's a dog ball lake that means that my Sukhois are directly ahead there are 16,000 feet just below me and orbiting so now we can start to dig into the auto to the radar I should say so let me get caught up in the manual and I'll be right back okay so reading through the section it looks like we have the main display head down display right down here in the middle it has some switches around the edges of it that I've been playing around with it for a couple of minutes here going through the manual ideally these would be sort of like a, a declutter function and also some functions for adjusting the uh, brightness and contrast. And I'll turn the RWR off just to get rid of the Sukhoi contacts. So I think a lot of this is still work in progress when it comes to a lot of the functionality. We can, however, turn it on and off using this switch, the M and A switch. And I'm starting to catch on that M is on, A is off in the <laughs> French language cockpit that we have here. Yeah, I know I'm probably stating the obvious to a lot of people, but that's the on and off switch. And here's the basic display. Now, uh, coming down to the controls, we have the main controls over here on the left horizontal console right by the throttle. And also, according to the manual, we have five functions on this panel that are implemented as of right now. And let me back off here for a second. Boy, the getting a lot of wind noise, and it was because I was getting up into some uh, higher Mach numbers, 0.86, which is fine, but I'll pull the throttle back a little bit. It was worrying me there for a second. I thought it was going a lot faster than I was from the sound. But okay, so control panel. Left horizontal console by the throttle. Five functions that are going to be active in the current implementation. The rest of it is either a work in progress or is going to be covering functions that aren't really going to have a, a purpose in the simulation. Kind of like how IFF in a lot of the implementations like for the mode 1, mode 2, mode 4, isn't really doing anything. A lot of this stuff will be in the same boat, but what does work is the dial, rotary dial up here that I can use to turn it off, to warm it up, and to turn it on. I'll put it to the EM position, and now we can see that we have the scan sweeping back and forth, and that's telling me that the radar is on. So I'll throttle back up a little bit to pick up some more speed. And that is that. Now, SIL. This is where we were by default. You can see I have SIL, that's just a standby position. I have PCH, which is a warm up, and I think we'll get into this once we do a cold start. That's the sort of warm up setting. And then I can put it over to the A on the dial, and that's going to turn it off. And you can see the radar with the slash. That means that it's just completely off. Now, even with it off, we have a lot of navigation info backed up for us here. So. On the bottom left, and I'll, I'll kind of go through this, bottom left I have waypoint number one. This is my currently selected waypoint. It's at 351 for 21.3 miles. So that's sort of backing up the display that, we, that I would have down here on the INS. I also have airspeed, so I'm at 0.67 Mach, and coming down through, let me push it up a little bit to bump that back up. So coming up through 304 knots, I have my altitude, which is at 20,100 feet. Yep, that's correct, 20,100 feet, uh, expressed in hundreds right there, and I can also look over here and see that on my actual altimeter. And I also have a heading, sort of a compass tape, down here at the bottom that's telling me that I'm turning left through due north, and I, in the middle I have this. And let me disengage the autopilot, make sure this is what I think it is. Yeah, that's sort of just a backup for my aircraft attitude right there, and I'll re-engage the autopilot in the altitude hold mode and let it hold me in here so that's the basic information that's thrown at us on the display even when the radar off 
Now let me turn it back on to the EM position. Now we can see that we have the sweep going again. And I'll explore some of the other functions here. Now the other switches that are functional, I have a distance control switch right here. So click it up to increase the display distance. It's 40 miles right now. There's 80 miles and I can go all the way down to 5 miles. So this isn't really uh, affecting the radar range. It's going to scan all the way out to maximum range, but that's, that is going to affect the range that is displayed. And I also on my, let me see, it's on my throttle, I have a function mapped that can also, using the HOTAS, control the range. That actually goes all the way up to 160 using the throttle. So I'll bring it back down to a 20 mile scan and leave it there. That's about the point at which actually that's, I think my contacts are going to be about 15 miles out once I get into them and I'll leave it right there. So that's that switch. I also have the ability to put it into a different display format right now and that's controlled by this switch. I have two positions, PPI and B-scope. Right now it's in the PPI setting. That means that it's uh, sort of displaying this as like a 2D top-down rendering with the azimuth expressed radially. I'll try to make that make sense. Let me see. So picture that your aircraft is right here at the bottom and the rest of the display is just a circular representation of the space. So if I had a contact right here where my cursor is, for example, I would be able to tell that it's at an azimuth of 30 degrees to my left. If I had one over here, I would tell that it was at 30 degrees right and then the position at it, that it shows up is just its range. Now I also have B-scope that I can put it in and it's a similar concept. Your aircraft is still down here at the bottom but whereas on the PPI the azimuth was expressed radially sort of going out diagonally from the starting point now if I have a contact at 30 degrees left azimuth it's just going to be at some point down this line 30 degrees right it'll be expressed at some point down on this line that's sort of how it is in the F-15 and uh, F-16 if you fly Falcon 4.0 but uh, it doesn't really matter uh, in fact it's just different ways of expressing the the same idea. I'll leave it in PPI. I actually kind of like this a little bit better when it comes to uh, just assessing the situation, but it's personal preference to me at least. So that's that. We also have the ability with two additional switches to change the azimuth or how far left and right the radar dish scans. So right now you can see that on each scan it's looking left and right a full 120 degrees, so 60 degrees to each side, and I think I have a visual aid here. Yeah, right there. So right now it's scanning 60 degrees to each side, so the entire green area that you see there on the knee board. If I put the switch to the 30 position, okay, now it's only going to scan the red area, and you can see the, the sweep change right there on the display. Okay, 15 is only going to scan the yellow area, so right there. And then, similarly, for elevation, I can change the number of bars that it sweeps. And yeah, there's the, the visual aid for this. So right now, by default, it's sweeping all four bars. So the sweep pattern is expressed kind of like this up top, where it's just kind of going back and forth and up and down. I can put this into the two position. Now it's just going like a little rectangular pattern, one position, and it's just going to sweep back and forth. And I guess how this would factor into your planning and why this would be significant. I'll put it back to the full 60 degree and four bar scan. Now say for example that we have no idea where these contacts are and I'll stow the checklist for now. If I have no idea where the contacts are and I'm just searching the area for aircraft, I would want as much of the sky being scanned as I can. But in a case like this, where I know that the aircraft are directly in front of me and I know the altitude, in this case, I don't necessarily want it scanning a big wide swath of airspace because, okay, here are the contacts right here in the middle of the screen. So the contact position is, well, in theory at least, only going to be updated like once every uh, 10 seconds or just whenever the scan happens to be at that point in the sky, that's when the contacts get updated. If I know where the contacts are and I know the altitude, I can put this, for example, to the 15 and 1 setting now you can see that it's only scanning that little piece of the sky where I know they're at so it's going to update their position and give me a much more accurate track of where these things are and I need to 
yeah, I need to come down a little bit to get them back into the scan. And that's sort of the disadvantage also of doing that. Let me go ahead and put it back to the four bar scan because, yeah, like you see, unless you know exactly where they're at, yeah, you can just miss a lot of stuff. So I've got it scanning a slightly larger area. Now the contacts are back. So that's the basic concept behind that. So I can tell there are 10 miles more or less and coming in. Now, other symbology that we get here, and let me see, the number right here I understand is closure rate in Mach. So I'm actually flying at Mach 0.8. The closure rate is Mach 0.7, so I can tell that these guys are uh, basically just flying like perpendicular to my path, not really closing or anything. 0.6, I'm flying at 0.8, so this guy is actually going in the opposite direction of me right now. That's about as close as I want to get to them or will be able to get to them. I'll kick it back out to the the full scan and start to pick some more stuff up. But that is my understanding of what that number is. Now, if I slew the cursor up and I have the cursor mapped, I believe it's this function right here on the throttle, but I have it mapped to my hotel so that I can slew the cursor around. The information that I'm given right here is going to be the range and the azimuth. So right now, for example, the cursor is at 14.8 miles at an azimuth of 13.7 degrees off my nose and to the right. And now I just need to find those contacts again. Okay, so I'll slew my cursor on over. And now to lock it, I have a lock command mapped on my stick. So when I have a contact, okay, one depression of the lock command to go to track while scan mode. And wow, I got all kinds of out of it there. Okay, let me bring that back up. And yeah, let me back off a little bit since I'm a little bit too close to make this work and I'll come back and we'll start to explore locking and symbology that we get when we have a target locked. So we'll be right back. <laughs> 